Today, we'll be asking the question, can you teach funny? And we'll be discussing the neurologic condition ALS. This is Doctor versus Comedian. I'm Dr. Asif Doja, and this is the Doctor of Laughs. Not a real doctor. Ali Hassan. Every episode, I pick a topic for Ali from comedy to entertainment, and I question him about it. Then Ali picks a topic for medicine and health and grills me on that topic. Today, we'll be asking Ali whether you can teach stand-up comedy, and we'll be discussing a list of books that may or may not be helpful in honing your skills as a stand-up comedian. And we'll be discussing the neurodegenerative disease ALS, a disease whose profile was raised several years ago by the viral ice bucket challenge. But first, Ali, how's it going? It's going all right. The summer's been okay. There's been some stand-up comedy. I got to perform at a drive-in theater in Peterborough. You know the thing I've been talking about since April on the show? Yeah, we talked about it very early on the podcast, and it kept getting put off and put off. So you just did it. You did it in Peterborough? Finally did it. Peterborough happened. This was with Sean Majumder? Yeah. It was great. It doesn't sound like it would be great, but, you know, people show up. They've got the, you know, vans and trucks and cushions. One guy had his van. This was kind of weird. This dude, brown guy lovely guy was sitting in the back of his van and he had decorated the back of his van like a Moroccan shisha house, right? He's got all these cushions and like a a kind of a bed. He was on a date. The girl, lady, woman he was with, they were adults, sat outside on a chair, on a plastic chair. Like she's like, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want anything to uh, do shisha cafe. Yeah, I don't know if you think I'm going to feed you grapes here, buddy, but this is, I'm sitting outside. Oh, and so you made fun of that? I did make fun of that, but they were good. They were a good sport, but they also didn't deny that they didn't really want to touch each other, or one of them so, didn't want to touch the other. I got a couple of questions, actually, about this whole thing. Not not about those two people. I really don't want to talk anymore about them, but the overall drive-in thing. So were people you like- You barely talked about them. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't want to talk anymore. We've given them so much <laughs> airtime. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, okay, so were most people in their cars or, or like that lady outside the car, like with a lawn chair? Some were in, some were on top, some were on yeah, top. Uh, top. Yeah. 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 Dent, dent your car. That's, yeah. You know. They don't see these are, these are, these are tough trucks. This is Peterborough. Oh, yeah. Buddy, okay? This is like, this is Ford not somebody F-150 on their tr- Nissan yeah, Leaf. Nice. Uh, yeah. This is, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, no electric <laughs> no, cars. That was, no, there actually was an electric, electric car. One of the funniest things I've ever seen. Now, let me paint this visual for you. Sean is making a joke about how the fact he's an old dad. You know, he had his first child at 48. He's going to have another child soon, either at 49 or 50. Wow. What? How old is Sean? I, I just said 48. I don't oh, know right, what. Sir. Oh, my <laughs> no, God. Then, no, how is this? He, how do no, we no, even have on. a podcast You together? said he had his first child at 48. Yeah, and last then, year. And then was I interrupted you. Well, you didn't say it was last year. Okay. And then I interrupted you. We say he's about to have his next child at 49. So I understand he's about 49 <laughs> or so. <laughs> almost Lord. 49. Anyway, okay. He's almost 50. He looks yeah, very young. So I don't young, know. He looks young. very young. He looks fantastic. And he was talking about his wife. He goes, you know, she's no spring chicken either. If you have kids around, just, you know, put your hands over their ears for a second, I guess. But he says, he goes, I didn't think we'd have kids. I thought it was, uh, you know, I'd be shooting sawdust into a, a vacuum bag, basically. So as he goes, I thought I'd be shooting sawdust into a vacuum bag. You know, like the, the car, the Bolt, the Chevy Bolt, a Bolt just turns around out of the parking lot and leaves. And at, it's <laughs> So I'm so, I'm this I'm in the side of this uh, parking lot, and they drive very slowly, which is so hilarious because you don't want to get out of battery mode. You know, you're in the bolt, and it it was either Peterborough's oldest parents or grandparents. I think it was grandparents with little kids, and one of the kids, as they drove by, was just looking out of the side of the car with their fingers curled over the window, kind of like a I don't want to leave, but they were like no sawdust into a vacuum bag we are out of here but we're also leaving very slowly because we're in an electric vehicle and we want to make sure we don't we want to make sure we get home we have an, enough electricity to get home to me that was the funniest moment of that entire show anyway 
Comedy is back, baby. I don't know if it's back. Are we going to have a fourth wave? Are we gonna, let's do an episode on how we're probably going to have a fourth wave. <laughs> please, please. Another time. Please let's, please, let's not do that. But you know what? Someone did suggest that we do an episode sometime. Uh, a listener said, can we do one on This Hour Has 22 Minutes, which is a very famous Canadian comedy show. And Sean yeah. was on, Majumder was on that for several years. So uh, we should think about that. Maybe we could even get Sean on the show sometime. Absolutely. Next time, if you coordinate this better, perhaps. Sure, sure. My buddy Trent McClellan is on the show now. And okay. I'm I'm certain we could have him on the show. And Mark Critch is a friend of mine. I had dinner with Mark Critch in St. John's just a what few the? weeks ago. Oh, yeah. N- yeah. Name so we, dropper. Well, no, here. all that to say it would be a fantastic, it's a great idea and it would be a fantastic episode. Yeah. Maybe as a new season is coming out. So yeah. Do you want to move on or should I ask you how you're doing rather than look like a complete narcissist? Like, Here's how I'm doing. Seven reasons why I'm great. Let's move on without asking you how you're doing. Well, I mean, those types of questions, like, you know, what do you want me to say? I I should just say, good. And then we play the music, right? (laughs) Because, you know, don't you hate it when there's there's somebody I know, I know a guy I went to med school school with where you run into him and you're like, hey, how's it going? And most people will say, oh, good. Yeah, not bad. How are you? But he's like, wow, you know. And then you go on for like 15 minutes about like, I didn't really want to know that. But he would probably say, why did you ask that question if you didn't want to know the answer? Exactly. Don't ask questions you don't want to know the answers to, right? This is it. This is it. That's what Jason Lawrence at Absolute Comedy taught me. Like you mean like when you're talking to a crowd? On the stage. Yeah, yeah. How are you doing? How are you doing? You better be ready for 15 different answers to how you doing. If not, why did you ask it? Or or like I wasn't like how you doing, but like any of you guys have the Nintendo PlayStation? Now, there could be yes, there could be no, there could be like, you know, gaming is for losers. There could be, you know, yeah, you better about, be ready for- They could probably heckle you and say, uh, Nintendo doesn't make a PlayStation, that's Sony. <laughs> Who's the loser now? <laughs> <laughs> I meant, uh, what is it called? A game, game state? What's the generic oh, word? Man. What's the generic word? Gaming for- console? Gaming console. That's right. <laughs> this has gone off the rails. <laughs> You want me to just say, how are you doing? And you go, good. And we go to music or do we not want to? <laughs> yeah, let's do it again. But we'll leave in all this stuff. How are you doing, Asif? Good. So, Ali, I've been wanting to ask you about this topic for a while now, because as we've talked about several times at the podcast, you keep dropping about how you're like a big professor at Queen's University that some call the Harvard of the North, but nobody who <laughs> does not go to that university calls it that. <laughs> but you, you're at, no, it's a very good university. It has a, a well-respected university in Canada. So you're teaching a course there. And I thought about like, you know, because you told me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but at the end of the course, you teach this course. It's in the Department of Theater, or is it drama? Uh, yeah, it's the or, Dan or, or, School of Drama and Music. Dan School? The Dan School, D-A-N, <laughs> yeah, Dan. We There's a lot of people named Dan in Kingston, so they just said, let's just name, no, it's a, it's a family or something. Big don- donors, I'm yeah. sure, to, to, to Queens. So, so you teach in that School of Drama, and you teach, what's the name of the, the course? Is called what? Introduction to Stand-Up Comedy is the one I'm teaching in September, and then there's a new course about diverse voices in stand-up starting in January. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Now, well, we'll talk about it. Sure, that's another maybe topic. That's another that's episode, a, that'd absolutely. That would be interesting to talk about that, actually. But do you expect these students to like perform like stand-up and have a routine at the end of this? Is that the practical exam? Like, What are they learning? That is, in fact, the final exam. But th- it's called Introduction to Stand-Up Comedy because I also want to teach... I'll be honest, I didn't want to do a whole semester of stand-up. The question you asked in the open is, can you teach somebody to be funny? And the answer is not always yes. You'd love it to be. Look, you could teach me how to play guitar, and I could play it, but could I really play it really well with my musical handicaps and, and, and various challenges? Not really. Some people can be prolific, some people can be very good, and some people will just be okay no matter how much they practice. What you can teach is the structure of stand-up. 
right? You can give somebody the tools, but the best, I believe this from day one, I started doing comedy at a place called the Comedy Works in Montreal and Jimbo, who owned the Comedy Works, I remember him being offended that one of the veteran comedians was starting to teach a stand-up comedy class. He was like, what the hell is that? What is that? You don't, you can't teach stand, you know where you teach stand-up? There. And he pointed at the stage. That's where you can teach it. That's where you learn stand-up. That's the only place you learn stand-up. And I believe that, that getting on stage was the greatest teacher. Now, not only that, but I also went Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I would go downtown and I would watch comedians and sort of like examine and learn and just soak in comedy. And sometimes, you know, I go there with a mission to like figure out how they set up, you know, what's their first joke? What's their closer? How do they set up each joke? But they're so unbelievably effortlessly funny that by the end of it, it was like, God damn it, I didn't learn a thing. I just, yeah, you were just enjoying the I was the enjoying comedy, it so yeah. much that I was like, I wasn't really a student tonight. But, you know, it's funny. I'm going to draw a parallel to medicine, right? And I think this is kind of the way you'd argue the point to Jimbo, who I was keep calling Jimbo Jones, assuming he was on The Simpsons. He's not. So, okay, well. So he, in, in medicine, you know, you do your first couple of years of what's called pre-clerkship. That's in-class learning, going to lectures and things like that. And then you transition to clerkship where you do the ward rotations, right? So you can't do one without the other in medicine, right? You can't, you can start in the wards on your first day, but that's probably a bad idea because you have no idea what, what you're even talking about. You don't have the basis in terms of how diseases work, how the human body works, right? Similarly, if you just did classroom stuff and then you put someone out there into the wards as a practicing doctor, they would fail immediately because they don't have that practical experience. So my argument to Jimbo was, you know, maybe you could do, you could do didactic teaching up until they get them to that point where you have all the basis, you know, you don't have to learn all those basics and the terminology and, and, you know, what does a set mean? What is, you know, all the, I don't know, you know, sure, whatever, sure, sure. You know I don't know. That, that's how I'm, I'm thinking about what it. What does a set mean? Yeah. <laughs> You're clearly a student of stand up comedy. Look, everybody learns differently at the end of the day. So there are some people who can watch and observe and do, and that's it. There's some people who don't need books. They don't need videos. They don't need instruction. And other people work better in that environment. Ironically, I don't work better in that environment. And yet here I am giving instruction. So, so that I wouldn't be accused of being too much of a fraud I made it an intro to stand-up comedy class. What that means is I wanted to really make it, the class should really be entitled stand-up comedy appreciation. That's what it should be called because that's the goal. Understand where it came from. It has racist roots in these minstrel shows in America in particular. And then, uh, you know, how what happened in vaudeville and then the borscht belt and I find that stuff incredibly interesting, what comedy used to be, especially the, the borscht belt comics of the 50s and 60s. You never learned a thing about them. Ne there was never one genuine thing coming out of their mouths, right? It was all like, my wife, my wife, I'll tell you, she's like this. Some of these guys weren't even married. So is stand-up comedy an inherently American art form? It's not. It was happening at the same time in the UK. It developed into a beast of its own in the UK. But but yeah, I think America has a, has a strong claim to a large part of what stand-up comedy has turned into. And so that's why we can talk about its roots in particular and not be like, well, what about England? What about Australia? Yeah. So, okay, well, let's let's go back. So, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Like, you didn't want the course to be just like, you're going to learn to be funny and you're going to learn to have a eight-minute set by the end of it. You want to be all-encompassing. But we go back to my question, though. So clearly part of your course is developing stand-up, right? So... Let me just focus in on that. Like, where do you start? Yeah. So this is, I was going to answer this too. Like, number one, I didn't want to look like a fraud because I can't even learn like this. And yet I'm teaching like this. But number two, I didn't want to do a whole class with what potentially half the class may not really be particularly funny. Now, these are drama students. Many of them are fantastic. A few of them, you know, these are second year students. I was like, oh, you have a future in television writing right now. You could drop out of Queens and write on some television shows right now. Some, some of these students were phenomenally, inherently funny. Whether those were their goals or not to write on television or not, I, I don't know. But some of them, I even told them, I'm like, you, I, I'm going to keep my eye on you because I think you have a very bright future in the comedy world. 
But the other thing is I wanted the appreciation because I, the other baggage I come with is that there's so many people who think they can do stand up, right? Oh, I could have done stand up comedy. Oh, it looks easy. Well, it looks easy because of all the work stand up comedians put into it to make it look easy. And so that's why I wanted that appreciation there too. And sure enough, when you get to the stand up portion, which is like the the final third of the class, you understood where stand up comes from. You understand now joke structure. And the second part, we're looking at the anatomy of a joke. You understand the history of comedy. You understand the different styles of comedy. So you can give it some thought. Would you be an alternative comic? Would you be a political comic? Would you be a, a absurdist or uh, observing? You know, and you, we've seen these different styles. And now the last third of class, you know, give it a shot. And, you know, certainly with some students, you see their material, material and you're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not really sure where the funny begins or ends here. You know, and I, I always go back to this one comedian who asked me years ago in Montreal to read over his set. Would you be able to help me with my set? And I remember he sent me the set and I just was like, this was the worst thing I ever volunteered to be part of because there's, it was just, it was just words. It was just words. And I was like, I, there's no setup. There's no punchline. There's no laughs in between. And so I just had to go back and be like, I'm not sure what you're going for. What does this mean? Why are you doing this? And it was really, this guy had the the greatest stage presence and the most awful sort of sense of humor. And so my worry is always like, will this happen with the students? And for sure, some of them are naturally very funny. And it's as if they've been working on sets for many years and now they finally get a chance to perform it. And others are like, it's, you know, more sort of verbal diarrhea and we got to kind of reel it in and be like, okay, you're going off the rails here. And, you know, sometimes that stuff that could be funny when you're talking to your buddies and you're in a basement apartment somewhere and you're having a laugh, you know, but it does require some degree of structure on stage. And some people, they don't really have that. And so if you can give them some structure and you can give them some, you know, the, the greatest advice that I also got from Jimbo is about economy of words. Don't take 12 words to say something you can say in five, right? So sometimes that's like, you're sort of rambling here and you just went on for, I would say about 30 seconds and none of this is actually funny. So let's scratch this out. And I really love those exercises with students about looking at like, let's get to the heart of what's funny. Let's get to the meat of what's funny here. And that same thing happens. It happens in writing. It happens in all kinds of writing, technical writing, like scientific writing, like I do. I, I, that, that's good advice. I think in any time you're trying to communicate something, Reverdy is a soul of wit is, a, is an old axiom, but you know, these things are all based in truth. So can you go into a bit of detail then about how you teach them about joke structure? Like, I mean, I'm sure that's like a whole hour or hour yeah, and a half lecture, I mean, but you know. The challenge there is, you know, the classic joke structure was you have a setup or you have a premise and then you have a punchline. Now, that's very, very simplified. You know, that's that Borscht Belt comics thing, but you can have misdirection. You can have tags on top of the punchline, two, three, four tags. You, you can be a storytelling comic and not have any of that in place, right? You just have consistently throughout your joke, funny things you're saying, and people just went along on a journey on a great story. So some of that stuff is harder to teach. And, and if you're using textbooks, you know, you can confuse people like, hey, I just wanted to tell this funny story and I don't really have punchline set up. I don't really have that. And then, you know, callbacks, teaching callbacks, how to call back to your own joke from, from the beginning. Sometimes it feels forced, sometimes it feels organic. So really it's about, Hey, let's, let's work on this. Okay. So what do you got? What are you working on? And some people have, a, I know exactly what I want to do. It's a story of when I turned 19 and how I woke up that morning and, you know, without any clothes on and how it led up to that. Okay, great. So you have that. Other people, I, I'm not sure what to do at all. So when you have 20, whatever I had, 30 students, you know, you have 30 different personalities, 30 different comedic styles. And in some of those cases, there's no style yet. There's nothing. That's what this course is about. But for, for some of them, I can picture that, you, you know, if they have it well formed, right, then it just, then it's like you said, maybe cutting out some words here, maybe putting a call back in here, you know, it's just kind of fine tuning that and coaching them a bit on it. But how, what do you do? No, if, if I, if I'm in your class and I'm coming up to you and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. 
I, I have no idea where to start. That happened with at least three students. So what like, do you do? Okay, can you tell us? Well, you go, I, well, you go listen. You have to mine your own life. You have to mine your own, your, your brain. It doesn't have to be personal, right? That's a style as well. It could be stuff that's happened to you. If not, it's like just observations. And we've also done exercises throughout the semester, right? In fact, we did so many exercises that I got an email from a student saying, sir, I love your course, but I'm doing more work in this class than I'm doing in my fourth year thesis class. I was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize, you know, because I'm (laughs) first time teacher. I'm like, I guess everybody loves this as much as I do. And I was overloading them. And in the, in the reviews also, one of the students was like the first two thirds of Mr. Hassan's class was absolute hell. And then it got better. And the reason it got better is because I took the, I was like, oh, I didn't even realize that I was giving you too much work, you know, cause it's all online and it's on zoom and I figure they have more time somehow they're just, but they are taking seven classes. So anyway, it took me some time to get used to that, but we were doing a ton of work and lots of exercises. So for example, 10 observations, all right, make them funny or make them funny, make 10 observations. Then the, you know, the next week, take those observations and make them funnier based on what we learned this week, turn those observations into something funnier, add a tag, a funnier premise, take, you know, where, when, why, how, put all these elements into your jokes. And so I'm going to show you what assignment was. This is the assignment that all these students hated. Number one, give me 10 examples of jokes that you love. All right. Then tell me who the comedian is and why you love the joke. Right. So for example, no, 10 examples, ten, that's a lot. Ten, dude, this is only one eighth of the assignment. That's <laughs> oh, why man. these people hate me. So then people went through their 10, then a comedy warm up exercise. Okay. This is from a book called comedy writing secrets. It's 20. What if scenarios that you find funny? So these are 20 different things. So that's already quite a bit. Then there's Another exercise, which is write five original funny things about the following subjects, animals, movies, transportation, food, right? So I'm making comedy difficult. I'm like making comedy, like, look, this is what you got to, this is, this. and then there's another exercise called the threes formula. Threes stands for target, hostility, realism, exaggeration, and then emotion, and then surprise is the S. So you have to put all that into like five to... So these guys are like, that's a stupid mnemonic, by the way, because you think it's going to be three things to talk about. Absolutely. But each of those letters is a, it's is a the a stupidest com- because comedy comes in threes as well, right? So yeah, it's of very, course. yeah. It's when ridiculous. they find out, it's when they find out it's six and nothing to. Well, do. no. So I hear you. I mean, you certainly did make it into a lot of work, and. I, I could see see the nuances here, as you said. Some people are funny with these with these already well formed jokes. Some of them need some work. Totally, and that, I told them that that's like a foundational exercise. So later, when you start developing your set, if you don't know what to talk about, you go back to this assignment. You wrote twenty things you found funny. You wrote about animals, movies, et cetera, et cetera. You wrote you did this threes exercise. So. I think I'm still going to give that exercise. I'm going to give it earlier in the semester so that they can still drop out of the course if they're like, this is too much work. Maybe I'll make it a slightly shorter exercise or, or break it in half. Well, let me ask you this question. So let's, I'm always curious about this because you get people coming up to you all the time with like, oh, you know, here's something funny. And they don't tell you a joke. They're just telling you something funny. And often they're not even doing that. They think they are, but here's a premise for you. I'm like, what is that? (laughs) That's nothing. So let's, let's do this right now and see how this works. And because I just wanted to see your thought process. So a couple of weeks ago, the Olympics have been over for a couple of weeks, but you and I were talking about the Olympics and a Canadian who won the gold medal in hundred meter butterfly was Maggie McNeil from London, Ontario, a big celebration across Canada. She did a great job. And then of course, Maggie McNeil, when you look at her, she's of Chinese background. In fact, she was born in China in February 2000 and was adopted by a Canadian family a year later. And so she's like 21 or so and grew up in Canada. And I just thought it's funny because the name Maggie McNeil, you hear that, oh, uh, you know, it's a a Scottish girl. You think that she'll look like my wife who has red hair and freckles, right? Like, oh, interesting. Okay. And so we were talking about that, but I'm like, is that anything? Is that a joke or is that just some dumb observation? Like, what is that? You know? Well, for me, it was, uh, you know, in that moment, I, I this, this is what my thoughts were, because when you look up Maggie McNeil, the, you look her up and the questions that come up 
what ethnicity is Maggie McNeil. So people are clearly curious oh, about it on Google, on Google right? right? Yeah. And another one that comes up is, is Maggie McNeil indigenous, right? Like everyone's trying to make <laughs> sense of her face and her name. So I was like, okay, so there is something there. People do wonder about that. The challenge, of course, is if people don't know who Maggie McNeil is, you have to paint the picture. And the way to paint the picture is you go to her real name. That That's the way I was thinking about it. And that real name, Hannah Margaret McNair, Maggie McNeil, is the real name. And so you're like, well, there's one thing we all know about Maggie McNeil. Her parents hate her Chinese heritage, right? So I'm not making fun of uh, Chinese. I'm not making fun of Maggie McNeil, McNeil. I'm making fun of her parents not even giving one not even a sousson, not even a, a hint of Asian left in her. And it's like, well, you know, she still looks Asian. Like there's going to be a lot of questions. You can't erase Chinese with seven white names. So that's the way I was thinking about it. Like, where do you go with that name? But again, you know, once the, once the Olympics are done, that is what's called a current, that's almost like political current events type of news, current event type of humor, I should say. So it has a very short shelf life. Yeah, by the time this podcast comes out, like, it, it, you know, uh, it's going to be a couple of weeks after the Olympics. Will people even re remember, you know? Like, yeah, which is a shame because she is a world champion uh, <laughs> record she, holder. You know, she, she's amazing. No, it might be they might remember her name, but they might not remember what she looks like or whatever. And then maybe it, it involves more explanations. So. Right. Well, actually, so that was another exercise we did, which is late night desk jokes. You know what I mean? Like late night comedy show. So you're, this is the exercise. You're writing for a late night comedy show. So pick things in the news. And I know that's a challenge for some students who are like, I haven't looked at the news in three years. I don't care about the news. That's not why I'm in the Dan School of Drama and Theater to read the news, right? Which is fair. I mean, the news can bring you down quite a bit. Or, you know, I have a poli sci background, so I approach things a little differently. For me, it's you know relatively important to stay on top of the news. But I also know that I got to take days off from the news sometimes. So I'm forcing some of these students to go into a place where, but that's, you know, when it comes to stand up, yeah, when you're working on your craft in the stand up comedy world, you can just sort of write five minutes, 10 minutes about whatever you want. But there will be times where somebody offers you a job and you're like, now you write this you write about yeah. this this is what by, you have by to... the way i'm like that's pretty much the definition of first world problems yeah i don't i don't really look at the news i'm like oh you know would you rather live in north korea where you have no access to news outside of the propaganda uh, you know given to you by the regime in power like you know anyway enough of my editorializing about great stuff uh, great uh, stuff. university students in so well let me ask you this then because a friend of mine a couple of years ago, well, many years ago, was interested in doing stand-up. Not you, but a different friend. Mm -hmm. And we said, I'm going to give it a try. So I said, well, how did you get prepared? He's like, oh, I read a bunch of books on stand-up. I'm like, reading a book on stand-up? Like, that's probably something that Jimbo Jones would also be like, no way. See, that's a callback right there. Eh? It, is. Eh? it didn't work the, the first back? time, the Jimbo Jones thing. But, you know, to call back to something that didn't really resonate the first time, I'm not sure if we call that a call back. Well, I this will. is in so, your brain. Your love for the right. Simpsons uh, right. is uh, so, pervasive. But G but Jimbo Jones would would probably be against the whole idea of like books on comedy. Sure. I mean, look, some of them are great entertainment. Like, let's okay. So the list that you had sent me as well that you're you're referring to is this Forbes list, and it's a list of comedy books is great. I love a list of comedy books. There's a couple of problems here, which is number one. And we'll put the link, by the way, we'll put to the this, link. Uh, uh, and then you can and see. And this is a dated article. This is from 2019. As you said, this was a few years ago when your friend was doing comedy. It's called The Standard Comedian's Library, 21 Books for Comics Who Care About Their Craft. Now, the title is a little misleading because it suggests that this can help you in comedy. And in some cases it might, but it's also books like, you know, so number one, The Serious Guide to Joke Writing by Sally Holloway. That, that could absolutely help you if you're trying to craft material. But then there's also Steve Martin's book. You know, it's called Born Standing Up. Now that's just, that's just great reading. 
That's Steve Martin's life because Steve Martin, not a lot of people will know, was one of the l- biggest stand-up comedians ever in the United States. One of the first, if not the first, to be s- out, uh, you know, selling out arenas in the late seventies, early eighties, selling out arenas, and then he just walked away from stand-up basically. So it's a book about his whole journey into it and out of it. He almost lost me on the couple of chapters on magic. To be honest, magic is the opposite of comedy in my mind. But th- anyway, I love Steve Martin, and, and and it was a great book. Book. Bossy Pants by Tina Fey is also that's not going to help your comedy, but it could inspire yeah, I mean, you. It, perhaps it's a great book, but it's it's really about her journey and really how you know improv was where she felt she fit in. That's what she discovered when she kind of went to I think when she went to college. Going into that, it's it's a it's a it's a great book. One of my favorite memoirs by a comedian. But I, I agree with you. It doesn't really, it's not going to really help you hone your craft, I would no. say. So there's ones about joke writing, which, you know, if you want to get into it, I, I'll personally suggest one that's not there, which is called the Comedy Writing Workbook. And, and that, you know, a lot of the assignments I gave my students were from the Comedy Writing Workbook. You're, you're like really getting into it and you're really testing your own metal. You're like, am I made for this? Would I be able to write 10 jokes, 20 jokes about a certain subject on demand? And it's not on demand. It's like, this is due in a week, right? This is what it's going to be. You have to write. So if you don't like joke writing, then probably comedy is not for you. And that book will really, really help you dig in. And, and all these exercises force your mind to work in different ways. And some of them, it's like, oh, my mind doesn't work that way. And other things, it's like, oh, I really like this. I like this idea of like putting the word pudding in a circle and then drawing lines like the sun, rays of sun outside from the circle. What is funny about pudding? And now you have, depending on how many rays you're saying you put, the word pudding, like chocolate pudding like made by jello right i i do i don't know what other kind of pudding there is it sounds like you're saying p-u-t-t-i-n-g oh like i'm putting this away oh does it so anyway well, I don't I'm know. Thinking, well i mean that's less funny i think pudding has more <laughs> uh a co- potential for comedy so you think about all the things that you can do with pudding and then you pick two or three of those and you work, start working on a joke. I always like that idea. I like that process. So when students come to me and like, I don't know what to do, go, what's a thing you think is funny? Think about that. Don't tell me what it is. You think about something you think is funny and you don't know why. And then try this exercise and see if that works. You know, try this exercise. Maybe this works for you. So there's some like in the joke writing, there's a number of books here that could be helpful to you. Judd Apatow's book is called Sick in the Head. Now Judd Apatow will give you a ton of advice in that book. There's inspiration. There's, you know, in his, in his theories and his advice and all this, but also it's Judd Apatow and they only make a couple of Judd Apatows every year. Right. You know, so how far you can go with that is uh, tough, but my personal recommendation in this list of 21 books, I have two that I would really recommend. I said Steve Martin was very enjoyable, but you know, if you don't know who Steve Martin is and you don't care about Steve Martin, you're not going to enjoy that book as much. We Killed is a book called The Rise of Women in American Comedy by Yale Cohen. And that is an oral history of the last 60 years of stand-up. You know, again, I bring this, my own baggage about people who are underappreciated and their contributions to certain fields are underappreciated. And I think you will really have a huge appreciation for what women were doing at the forefront of comedy, what they were doing behind the scenes, the unique challenges that women had. Like when, you know, Johnny Carson didn't like female comedians, didn't think women were funny. And that had an effect on comedy as a whole. Because now Johnny Carson, who was the late night show, he was the man. And he had a booker who would go to comedy clubs to see comedians to possibly book on Carson on the the late night talk show in the US. Now that booker would tell the club owner, don't put any women up. Johnny doesn't really like women or put one or two up. So now what you do is you have years and years and years of these lineups with just one or two or zero women. While women are toiling away and working their craft, they're not getting any recognition. So stuff like that for me is super, super interesting. And finally, anything Cliff Nesteroff does, Cliff is spelt K-L-I-P-H. He's a, I think he's a Va- Vancouverite originally, he's Canadian originally, but he has become one of the biggest voices in comedy history. So his book called The Comedians, he has a couple of different books, but his book on comedy history is 
Very, very interesting. This guy has, I mean, I think he has some a master's or a PhD in, in, in comedy history. He, his ability to dig up nuggets that you don't find anywhere else is really, really quite impressive. And he's also the guy who, you know, gave us all a reality check in the sense that people were like, comedy is a vehicle for change. Comedy can do that. And he, a guy who has studied comedy, almost 200 years of it in various forms, said, I don't believe that's true. Because if comedy could affect change, Jon Stewart and The Daily Show, one of the most popular shows of all time, one of the most influential hosts of a show, would have created a world or an America, at least, where we wouldn't have voted for a Trump. So there's hundreds of examples of that as well. So just to wrap up, speaking of affecting change, yes, I'm going to just bring it down to a smaller level. Segway Jones over here. What do you got? <laughs> Have you? Yeah. he Actually, Segway Jones is related. He's the cousin of good old Jimbo Jones. Uh. Anyway, the uh, uh, what I was going to ask you, change on a smaller level, how has you trying to teach these students to be funny, how has that impacted your comedy? I mean, it puts a little pressure on me. I'll say that because if somebody introduces of me as like he's stand-up comic, he's this, he's this, and he teaches stand-up at Queens, all of a sudden you don't want to really, you know. I mean, bombing is such an integral part of it, but visually the optics are so bad. Like, oh, that guy teaches comedy. That joke sucked. I'm like, yeah, that's the that's the process, people. It sucked for a reason. It's, there's a method to the madness. All right, switching gears to something arguably not comedic at this point. Asif, I, first things first, we are going to talk about ALS, but I want you to mention why we're talking about this subject, how this came about. Right. So we had a listener named uh, Jan who has a relative who is dealing with ALS. And she's like, you know, would you guys ever talk about this? You know, and uh, I can mention a bit later on maybe why she thought it might be appropriate for the podcast. And she, you know, she said just kind of raise awareness of what's what's going on. And then I'll, I'll mention later on as well. I, I have some personal connections to ALS through some friends, some good friends of mine. But it was a listener who said, you know, when we talk about it, I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Should we talk about it? I was a bit worried about my friends who are, who are family members are dealing or have dealt with ALS about talking about it. But in the end, I thought it was, it was a worthwhile subject to, to discuss. Thank you from myself as well, Jen, because that was on a, a list of proposed topics we had, but we both found it so incredibly like serious and, and, and also sad that we were like, oh, maybe we shouldn't bring this up. But it's a good reminder that no, why should we, we, we've talked about sad topics before. So this is something that we can broach regardless how serious it is. So I also have a Two people I know, one particularly well, who who passed away from ALS, and I think maybe that was reluctance on my end too, but I wanted to know, dude, what is it? Where has it been? Why does it exist right now? That, that, that's really the crux of what I'm asking you, but I think many people got to know ALS because of this ice bucket challenge. And I don't even know if I would have participated in the bucket challenge had it not been for Joanna Downey, who was this terrific comedian originally from Montreal in Toronto. She was suffering from it. So I was like, all right, let me do my part to just get people aware of it. But, you know, what has the awareness even done? Like this disease is so incredibly degenerative. You know, it's good that we know about it, but what does it mean to have known about it? Is it simply a case of like, well, we're going to donate money to help find out about it? Was that the idea behind awareness? But let, well, let's back it up and let's start with what is ALS for those who may not know. Yeah, let's talk about that. Maybe we'll talk about the ice bucket challenge in a bit. So yeah, so it's basically a neurodegenerative disease. It was described first in the 19th century. And it's a disorder that causes progressive muscle weakness and disability and eventually death. When you get it, the median survival is three to five years. And again, like many things, I know patients and family members, and I know you get frustrated when I say we don't know the cause. We don't often know the cause. And there's no cases of people surviving it. Is that right? It's, it's effectively a death sentence? Well, it's very interesting you say that because Stephen Hawking was, th a lot of people say he has ALS, but it's not possible that he had ALS because he was stable over time. 
for years and years, right? Stephen Hawking was alive for more than three or five years after he was diagnosed. So he didn't have ALS. He, the thought is that he had a motor neuron disease, and that's what ALS is, but he probably had some sort of atypical form. But people who actually have ALS, the vast majority will die within this three or five years. Some live longer, some live shorter. So what happens is, I don't want to get into too much details of the anatomy, but in our spinal cord, we have what are called motor neurons. And these neurons, they're the, the cell body where our nerves originate from, okay? And so in our brain, we think about something, the pathway goes all the way down to our spinal cord, then the next target is these motor neurons, and then it goes to our nerves and muscles. And it's these cells in our spinal cord that degenerate in ALS and some other diseases, which we'll probably talk about in another episode. That's not the only area that has this neurodegeneration. Other areas in the nervous system also have it. And that's why we can see some other signs as well. But the main thing that you see in people is weakness. Okay. You can also get what are called fasciculations and we all get fasciculations. Uh, you know, when you're really tired and your upper eyelid yeah, yeah. is a bit, right? Yeah. 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 The twitch. That's a fasciculation. That's a heartbeat. That's, <laughs> People who don't know the word fasciculation, there's a heartbeat in my eyeball. There you go. That's right. It's like a flickering and people can get that anywhere. That upper eyelid when you're tired is pretty common. You know, eye strain when you've been up late on your computer or something, but you can get that in your legs and arms. That is a sign of your motor neurons degenerating in ALS, but you have to have weakness as well. So in other words, when you and I get that flickering in your eye, that does not mean anything. That's just a normal kind of fatigue thing that your, your muscles are feeling fatigued, but you get this over time. And the problem is in ALS, you get all your muscles becoming weak. And then you eventually have your muscles of what we call respiration. So your breathing muscles in your rib cage and elsewhere. And then eventually that's what leads people to pass away. What is the rate? How many people are affected by ALS in society? And does it affect kids too? Yeah, it really almost never affects kids. There are some variants like we talked about with Stephen Hawking. And again, I don't really know what Stephen Hawking has. It's very unclear from me reading the medical literature around him, what exactly he had, but kids can sometimes have some variants of it, but they're very, very rare. There's a different condition that affects these motor neurons called spinal muscular atrophy, which we'll talk about in an upcoming episode, but that's a different disease. So it's very uncommon in kids. It really isn't a disease of, of elderly people and the risk of it increases with each decade. So usually it's after age 40, it will occur. But I think you had a friend who was younger than 40. Yeah. Yeah. Just in his later thirties. Yeah. So it can happen in the, and then, but it peaks at age 74. That seems such a strange thing because in the seventies, you're thinking, oh, you know, my parents, I'm worried about dementia. I'm worried about stroke. I'm worried about heart disease. And it seems crazy to be thinking about this neurodegenerative disease that causes this profound weakness at that age. But it's not as rare as people think. And Jan sent me some, some information, our listener, and I talked to some of my friends whose parents have had it. And that's one of the messages that people want to get across. It is not rare. One in 300 people will receive a diagnosis of ALS oh in their God. lifetime. That's ex- yeah. excessively high. That's and And, and, it, and high. that's similar to multiple sclerosis, which we think is, 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 you know, common. We hear about it all the time. But there's only about 3,000 Canadians living with ALS at any time, which is still a huge amount, by the way. But I say only, the reason is people with MS, for example, don't die from MS until very, very, if they do, it's very, very late in the disease. So there'll be many people living with MS at a given time, but there'll be less people with ALS living in a given time because they pass away from it in three to five years. Right, right, right. right. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Remind me what ALS stands for again. So it stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Okay. And this was originally called Lou Gehrig's disease as well, so, right? Yeah. Sorry. You know, I, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. So he was a famous baseball player who had the disease and it, it, that's why it was another name for it is Lou Gehrig's disease, but in medicine, we call it ALS. The other thing to remember is that there is some genetic causes. So we talked about, we don't know the cause. There are some rare genetic causes that cause a familial form of ALS, but that's the vast majority of patients do not have that. So 90 to 95% of cases are not genetic. So in other words, Ali, what people, again, my friends want to get across is you're at risk. I'm at risk for this. And you don't know because we're not, you know, we're just getting into the peak age group. 
right? And so to think that we may not be affected, you, you, you don't know that until much later. Just because it doesn't run in your family doesn't mean anything. All right. So classic medical community. We don't know. We don't know. Uh, I guess, what do we know? Like, is there any progress in the treatment yet or is it too early still? So, yeah. I mean, most people start with having some leg weakness. That's the common. It could be weakness elsewhere, but leg weakness is a pretty common and one side versus the other, right? Or some in about 20% of cases will have what's called bulbar muscle dysfunction. So swallowing, slurring of their words. The problem is, remember I said the peak age is at in your later years, 60, 70. If you start to develop leg weakness or you develop problems swallowing or speaking, what would you think if your parent had that? You think they had a stroke, right? Mm. Well, we used to ask Joanna. Joanna used to host a comedy show every every week. And week after week, all of us were like, are you wasted? Are you drunk? And it wasn't on, she was a drinker, but it wasn't on brand for her to be drunk before her show starts. And she goes, no, no, something's happening. I don't know. I get the, gotta get this checked out. So I, her thing was the slurring. And I remember that it went from slurring to, yeah, it's a, as you say, degenerative. And so one, one, so th this is what happens over time. So, but you don't think about it over time, right? You just think that maybe it's a stroke, maybe it's something else. And in fact, another thing that people want to highlight is the delay in diagnosis. So, so one of my friends whose mother passed away from ALS, she wanted to highlight us to highlight the, the delay in diagnosis. So there's an article that we'll link to where basically the article talks about this delay in diagnosis. Most studies report a delay from the time of your symptoms really being prevalent to being diagnosed as 10 to 16 months. And it's because people often get referred, oh, you're having some slurring of your speech. Maybe I'll refer you to a speech therapist, or maybe you just need some physio for that leg, right? And you're not getting to see a neurologist. So you got this delay in getting an inaccurate diagnosis, like you did, like, oh, it could be a stroke, let's do an MRI. So, you know, as the people know in Canada, sometimes you have to wait for an MRI. So then you wait for the MRI, and then, oh, the MRI was normal. That's, that's interesting. I wonder what that was all about. Let's do some blood tests. Then you do the blood test, you wait for the, you know, and it's this delay, and then you see a neurologist. And they say actually younger patients, like your, your friend who passed away, are more likely to be correctly diagnosed, whereas older patients, again, because they think, oh, you probably had a stroke, maybe it's some sort of dementia. And the people with that swallowing dysfunction actually get diagnosed sooner because that really impairs your, your life if you can't swallow, right? They get diagnosed. So the idea is hopefully physicians will be more inclined to think about ALS and then refer people on. So the awareness is huge compared to what it was. Many people will know about it. You're talking about how many people get it a year, at least in Canada. What's being done about it? What, what, is there any treatment? Is there anything promising coming out of it? Yeah. I mean, like I said, you, you'll, you'll get these tests by your doctor and MRI, sometimes an EMG, which looks at the muscles in your body. And then the doctor will give you a diagnosis, but then what happens after that? And in terms of treatment, there's not a ton of effective treatment. The mainstay of care is what's called multidisciplinary clinic. So you go to a clinic, you get see a neurologist, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, respiratory therapist, because of your breathing, uh, dietitians, because you eventually can't eat. And then what do you do? Like you, how do you get nutrition, right? Some studies have shown that a multidisciplinary clinic, where you have all these people is better than just say, just your neurologist following or just your family doctor. So that can provide people with a better quality of care. And you need to intervene quickly with these other things because the deterioration, like we said, is a couple of years. You know, it's funny, Ali, like I definitely know more people personally who've had ALS than MS for sure. And probably cancer is about equivalent in terms of people I know, because again, when Megan and I first moved in our first house, someone down the street was doing all this construction and remodeling their house. They put a ramp in at their house. And then one day this gentleman was in a wheelchair and he kind of came up to us and uh, started talking to us. And, you know, he was telling us he was diagnosed with ALS and they had to redo their whole thing and invite us in for like a coffee or whatever at the, at their house. And then, you know, a year later he passed away. So that just highlights to me this, the speed that you need to get things going 
in, in terms of supports for families. Again, people have to remodel their house. They have to get lifts to kind of move people from one area to the other. It's constant supervision. And something else that some of my friends want to highlight is it's very important to have appropriate supports because it can be very isolating for families and for people. And the other idea to talk about is caregiver burnout, right? Because, you know, it's often the spouse or the kids who are taking care of somebody who needs almost total care by the end of it. And you really need to make sure that, that we're doing something to make sure people are supported by their community. In terms of treatment, there are a few drugs that are approved in Canada. One is called Riluzol, and the other is Adaravone. And they both can sort of decrease progression of the illness a little bit. Neither does much. They, they kind of modestly slow progression and functional deterioration, but they're not a cure. They're not like when you think about antiretrovirals for HIV, right? Where you take it and you're basically fine and you, you slow the disease so much that you basically don't have it anymore. I mean, that's not true, completely true for HIV, but people with HIV often do not develop AIDS in developing countries who get anti antiretrovirals. It's not the same for this at all. It will slow the progression, but you still will progress. There are several studies going on right now looking at stem cell therapy and some other new drugs that are on the market that hopefully will help. Some of them are being tested just in those people who have genetic problems, but we really need to increase this. And this is what Ajan, our listener, kind of said. And this is why she said, you know, maybe it's a dark humor kind of thing. But she's like, you know, her. I think her point was that people have a very short amount of time to live when they get diagnosed. So why are we wasting time? She's like, your house is on fire and you're checking. Oh, let's check the water pressure of the hydrant first. Let's make sure all the hoses are nice and intact. Let's lay them all out. Let's make sure everything is looking good. And this is what she sent me in a, in a DM. Like, you know, what, why are we doing all these things? Like, yeah, let's just double check this. She's like, time is running out for these people and we're taking so long. And so I think that last thing that people want us to cover is the advocacy for ALS. So you know, advocacy is such an important part of ALS. And so there's different organizations. So in the U.S. is the one that we kind of know the most, and that's this ALS association, which is ALS.org, because they were the ones that kind of raised all that money through the Ice Bucket Challenge, and which is seven years ago now. Can you believe that? It seems like it just happened. It was seven years ago. I only know it's seven years ago because... My young son, who is now going to be 10, didn't have the arm strength to lift the ice bucket over my head. He was a little dinky weakling. And I remember the video for that reason. He couldn't lift it. So he just like poured it on the middle of my back. <laughs> so for people <laughs> who don't remember what this was, it was you basically had a choice of either getting a bucket of ice dumped on your head or donate money to fight ALS or both. You know, most people did both. And it would, you saw all these videos of people and it just became more and more famous people. So Justin Bieber, LeBron James, James, LeBron James. <laughs> Interesting British pronunciation, King James. Jeff Bezos, okay, whatever. Oprah, Bill Gates, George Bush, and Barack Obama didn't dump the ice bucket himself, but still donated. And so they raised $115 million that year, which is double the amount that they normally raise in a year. So in other words, their fundraising is actually pretty good, but to double that in a year, and there's a interesting article on vox.com, which you can see from a couple of years ago, where they talk about the money that came in to the ALS Association and how that money was used. And they use it relatively well. And there are some financial challenges when you get a big windfall like this, but I think they use it relatively well compared to some other charities who got big windfalls that are not ALS related. So that's one organization. There's another organization in the US called I Am ALS, which has done a lot of work trying to boost money for research and to get treatments for people. This guy, Brian Wallach, I uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name properly, W-A-L-L-A-C-H. He was diagnosed with ALS at age 37, and he previously worked for Obama. And he has a very interesting story about how he started I Am ALS and working towards this research. And some of the interesting things that they point out on these different ALS websites, especially in the U.S., studies have shown that U.S. military veterans are twice as likely to develop ALS than the general population. 
Come on, what is that about? So that's the, we're going to get another. I don't know. Th- so we, well, that's the thing. That's true. We, so we don't know why that is. Is it some some toxin? Something they're exposed to? Is it stress? We don't know. But it's it's definitely something to look at. Another thing we didn't talk about this before, but in terms of risk factors, we don't. There's not a lot of risk factors. It's mainly age, and if you happen to be one of those rare people with a family history where it's the it's the genetic form, but. They also suggest that cigarette smoking may be a risk factor for ALS. That's kind of accumulating over time. Again, no one knows why that is and exactly how that would predispose people. But that's what this research is for, right? That's what all these organizations are trying to raise money for. But I think one of the attacks in the U.S. is to say, like, look, it affects these U.S. military veterans, or perhaps the military and the government should be investing more in ALS research. In Canada, we have ALS.ca and we have ALS Action Canada. And ALS Action Canada is a very interesting organization who uh, basically did this huge research position paper that they wrote, came out last summer, and it's never been undertaken, something like that in Canada. And then they gathered all the evidence, again, from a grassroots organization and circulated the paper and basically try to develop a holistic plan for for Canada, not just with research, but support for people living with ALS. So I think these advocacy groups are very important and are really kind of the lifeblood of support and fundraising for ALS. One thing to keep in mind is, I just keep thinking about something you mentioned at the beginning of this section of the podcast, and you said that this is a sad sort of thing to talk about. But that sadness you hope would turn to action because we obviously want to talk about things that have happy endings, right? And currently for the vast majority of people living with ALS, it doesn't turn out to be a happy ending. But the problem is when we hear, we as a society hear about a sad diagnosis or prognosis like that, we kind of want to block it out. But that should be the opposite of what we're doing. And that's what all these advocacy groups are trying to do. Again, they're trying to say, like, when you have this diagnosis, you have a very limited amount of time. So we should be focusing so much research into this, right? Because it's an often fatal disease in a very short amount of time. So I just want our listeners to think about what can they do? We've named four different organizations that are, exist in the US and Canada. And there's lots of these organizations across the world as well. If it's you're from a, a country outside the US and Canada, you, you can think about doing lots of things. People who invested in the Ice Bucket Challenge, that was very helpful. But that was a one-time influx of cash to the ALS Association in the US. And other organizations across the world also got influx of cash, but people should think about, is there anything I can do in terms of volunteering or even becoming a monthly donor? These things would would really help. And I would encourage people to look more into that. And yeah, I did say the word sad. I did use that. And I think that's that's not maybe not great. I just know that, that this, this, there was a lot of sadness around the people who were in the lives of these people we know who have ALS. And, you know, you try to be hopeful and you try to be positive for them because they're going through their own level of grief as they know that their quality of life is decelerating very quickly. So I did want to end on a positive note. My friend Joey Elias had pointed out this particular article to me and this particular person. And this is somebody named Chris Snow. He is the assistant general manager of the Calgary Flames in the NHL, and he's been publicly battling ALS. So he was diagnosed in 2019 and given a very short lifespan. I mean, he was given, I mean, I don't know what it was. It was something like eight months to live. And he has been taking this Maybe you can talk more about that, Asif. He's been taking this experimental medication. It's still in trials, right? It's in a phase three clinical trial. And that is actually, now, this may not sound promising to many people, but when you're in that world of ALS, this is promising. It paused his ALS for nine months. Absolutely. So this medication is called Tofferson. It's a genetic therapy. So you can only really use it for people who have a genetic form of ALS. And remember, we said that's the vast minority, like 5%. And so he actually happens, Chris Snow actually happens to have the genetic form. So he has what's called a SOD1 mutation, which is showing the genetic error that has caused ALS in him and his family members, which can often cause a very aggressive disease. And so that's what this is looking at. And so we'll talk about this on a future episode. This is using what's called an antisense oligonucleotide, which is a DNA therapy. The very short way I think about these DNA-based therapies is they're replacing this erroneous DNA with good DNA. 
That's essentially what's going on. But it only works for this. So far, the evidence is for this genetic form of epilepsy. And you have to have spinal taps to to infuse the medication. And so and so it sounds like he has responded. At least he's seen this this pausing for a time being. And so this is definitely promising. And we'll talk about this uh, antisense therapy for other diseases in the future. We'll talk about it for a relative of ALS, which I was talking about before in the podcast, which is spinal muscular atrophy, which only occurs in children and has some features that are a bit different, but it's a purely genetic disease. And so there's some very promising research, which I'll talk about for that as well. So, you know, I'm hoping that maybe they'll find that this works for patients with the genetic form. Maybe it'll work for patients with the non-genetic form. We're, we're hoping that they we're still waiting for all the final results to come out. And of course, the long-term follow-up after that to monitor for side effects and, and prolonged efficacy. Right. And as we say goodbye today, I would like to say that we'll include a link to the story about Chris Snow. And also Kelsey Snow, who's Chris's wife, uh, was, a, was a sports journalist for many years, and she has a a blog called Kelsey Snow Writes, and she details the life of, of living with somebody with ALS. If anybody's interested in that, it's it's very personal. It's very compelling writing. And I, I think we'll include a link to that as well. So that's our show for today, Ali. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, what do you want to call this? It's a bit of an emotional journey, especially if you know people who have suffered through ALS, but uh, hopefully we let people know that it's just the beginning and and there are groups, uh, advocacy groups, and there is like a small glimmer of hope that will hopefully turn into something more hopeful over time. You mentioned HIV, which was obviously uh, hopeless at one time in the 80s, right? It was like a death sentence. And hopefully it's a similar thing where these things take time, they take money, they take investment, they take interest from the science community and, and, and society at large. And I think we're uh, we're seeing that. Well, yeah, quite an episode. We laughed and cried, <laughs> ran the gamut of emotions. Mm -hmm. But just before we get out of here, anything to plug there, Ali? No, I think standupali.com is a place you can go. And all uh, things that are coming up, I'll uh, put news up there. I'll put news about any, you know, if some of these auditions I'm doing go well and turn into something, I'll let people know what's happening. Yeah. Definitely. You know, there's a few things coming down the pipeline, but nothing confirmed. So standupali.com is the best place to go. And I'll have some, uh, I'll share good news here and there as it, uh, as it comes my way. But definitely something to plug right now immediately is this website. We have a listener base that continues to grow and we really appreciate it. We thank you for spreading the word. If you can spread the word to just two people about this podcast, if you think they would be fans and there's information in here that they would enjoy, we would really appreciate that. Absolutely. Dr. V comedian at gmail.com. If you want to reach out to us or on social media, Dr. V comedian on Twitter, on Instagram. We're everywhere. Facebook, LinkedIn. You can find us uh, just about everywhere. And please reach out to us, as Ali said. And remember that although I'm a doctor, I'm not your doctor. Medical issues we talk about are for your interest and in information only. And they're not medical advice. Please consult your medical professionals for actual medical advice. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. See you next time.